Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute, and production of this episode was made possible by a grant from the Roller Bottomore Foundation of Richmond, Virginia. Hello, and welcome to episode 287 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. How did elections in the United States develop? Who is American democracy for, and who gets to participate in that democracy by voting? These are the questions that we've been investigating since the start of our four-episode series about elections in early America. And episode by episode, we've come to know a fair bit about how elections in the United States developed. In our first episode, episode 284, Holly White helped us see that British North Americans thinking about democracy and the ways they held elections came directly from the thoughts and traditions of early modern England. In our second episode, we discovered what the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution of 1787 had to say about elections and how early Americans took what those constitutions had to say to hold the first federal elections in the United States. And throughout our second and third episodes, we've investigated who early American democracy was for and a bit about how that definition has changed over time. Now, all of this information brings us to our fourth and final episode in this series. What does the Constitution have to say about electing the president? And how is the president of the United States actually elected? This is where Joseph Edelman comes in. Joe is an assistant professor of history at Framingham State University in Massachusetts. He's also the assistant editor of digital initiatives at the Omohundro Institute. Joe is a historian of media, communication, and politics in the Atlantic world. And you may remember our conversation with Joe in episode 243, when he shared details of his book, Revolutionary Networks, The Business and Politics of Printing the News, 1763 to 1789. Joe will be our guest and guide in this episode as he helps us explore presidential elections in the Electoral College in early America. But first, just a reminder that Holly, Joe, and I have prepared a list of companion readings, exhibits, and digital resources to help you take your interest in early American elections further. You'll find these resources in the Omohundro Institute's brand new OI Reader. Now a web-based app, the OI Reader offers digital editions of the William & Mary Quarterly the leading journal of early American history since 1943, and an open WMQ section, where we'll be posting additional digital resources for some of our podcast episodes and series just like this one. To access these resources, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash oireader. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash oireader. Okay, are you ready to dive into the fascinating history of presidential elections and the Electoral College? Here's Joe Edelman to take it away. Every four years since 1788, the United States has held a presidential election. And every four years, Americans have found the process confusing. For most of the elections we've talked about in this series, the winner was determined by counting the votes and figuring out who had earned the most. It's what political scientists call a first-past-the-post system. But the Constitution provides different rules for electing the president. According to Article 2, each state selects a number of electors who cast ballots that pick the president and vice president in an indirect election, the group of people we call the Electoral College. In our world, we recognize it through maps with states shaded red and blue as analysts discuss electoral math and debate which state's electoral votes might tilt the contest in one direction or the other. News organizations tally the popular vote count, too, but as we've seen in multiple recent elections, the person who wins the most votes nationally doesn't necessarily win the election. To make a long story short, if you find the Electoral College a little odd and bewildering, you're not alone. So how did we end up with this system for choosing a chief executive? Why is it more complicated than the process for selecting other officials? And how did that system develop in the early United States 
into something that looks like the system we employ today. To understand how the presidential election process was designed and how it developed in the early U.S., we turn first to Alexander Kesar. Alex is the Matthew W. Sterling Professor of History and Social Policy at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. He's written several books about voting and elections in the United States. His most recent book, just published in the summer of 2020, is called, appropriately, Why Do We Still Have the Electoral College? Alex, let's start with the basics. According to the Constitution, as it was written in 1787, how did the president get elected? The process actually resembled to a remarkable degree the process that we have now, but there were some procedural intricacies that were different. In effect, the president was being chosen by electors that were selected by each state. The number of those electors were equivalent to the number of representatives and senators that each state had, and they would be chosen in a manner to be determined by each state. This is something that is different than the current practice. According to the Constitution, there was no requirement, and there still is no requirement, there was no requirement that a popular election be held. So states chose their electors in a variety of different processes. In some cases, there was a popular election throughout the state. Other cases, there was an election for electors by district. In a number of cases, and this was true throughout the early period, state legislatures chose electors by themselves. Once the electors had been chosen, they then some weeks later met in the state capital to formally cast and certify their votes. The results of those meetings were forwarded to Congress. The votes were opened later and counted and certified in Congress. Many Americans find the role of the Electoral College to be just utterly baffling. And I'm sure you know this from talking about the Electoral College yourself with various groups. Can you help us understand, Alex, why the drafters of the Constitution included these electors as middlemen for selecting the president? I mean, there were a number of features of the Constitution that were compromises. They included the electors in part as a way of leaving some power in the hands of the states. But it was also believed that the people in general, or even state legislators, might not know the different candidates from different parts of the country, but that the elites, it was expected that the electors would be notable people. They would be elite, they would be well-educated, better connected, and that they would have greater familiarity with the candidates who could make wiser decisions. There's a certain logic to that, but I'm curious how the delegates in Philadelphia got to the electors as a solution. How did the debates about presidential elections play out in 1787? I think one thing that we have to recognize about the creation of the institution we now call the Electoral College is that it emerged from a constitutional convention in 1787, during which it became apparent that there was a lot of uncertainty about how to choose a chief executive. It was not obvious to anyone how this should be done. When the delegates to the convention convened in Philadelphia in June, The default position was that Congress should choose the president. After all, they didn't have any real models elsewhere. Under the Articles of Confederation, which was what governed the states at that point, there was no separate executive branch. So they were trying to figure something out. There was a lot of uncertainty about it. And the basic notion was that Congress would choose the president. In the course of the summer, The convention repeatedly had kind of straw votes about this. And repeatedly, those straw votes revealed that the strongest preference was to have Congress choose the president. But each time, you know, in the aftermath of it, it's clear, reading a little bit between the lines of the convention records, that that was a very unsatisfying solution, that the whole idea of separation of powers would be jeopardized. Congress chose the president. So they kept coming back to it. They kept circling back to it. They introduced other ideas. They actually talked about having a national popular vote. James Madison, interestingly, was in favor of that. 
They talked about having governors choose the president, but they couldn't agree. They kept going around and around. At the end of the summer, and again, Philadelphia is hot in the summer. They were tired. They were nearly done. But one of the items that they had not taken care of, one of them being how to choose the chief executive. So most members of the convention went on vacation, and they appointed a committee to stay in Philadelphia, you know, sweat to death, and answer this. It's called the Committee of Eleven, or sometimes referred to as the Committee on Postponed Parts. It was that committee which came up with the idea. And when you look at the evolution of the debates in the convention, one way to understand what the Electoral College is, is that it's actually a replica of Congress. In other words, the representation from each state is the same as it would be in Congress, which had been decided much earlier in the summer. It was a replica of Congress, but it met only once, had no power to legislate, and thus the separation of powers issues and the potential corruption was not a concern. I'm glad you brought up compromises, because in popular discussion about the Electoral College today, commentators often point to the three-fifths compromise to suggest that the electoral system was designed as part of a scheme to protect the institution of slavery through the voting power of especially southern states. Can you explain, Alex, how these two constitutional provisions interacted in the early United States? Sure. And this is, as you mentioned, a much discussed subject. My own conclusion, and not everyone agrees with this, although my stance here is not idiosyncratic, there are a number of other historians who agree with me, is that the Electoral College was not created to protect slavery or slave owners, per se. What happened in the course of the summer was that slavery and the slave states were protected with the three-fifths compromise, as you mentioned, which gave the slave states representation in the House of Representatives, not only for their adult white freemen, but for three-fifths of other people, as they were called, three-fifths of the slaves. That compromise had already been agreed to. It was imported into the design of the Electoral College by the decision to allocate electoral votes in the way that we do. I don't think that it was specific intent of the design of the presidential election system or the Electoral College, but it did, of course, sort of reinforce the extra power that was given to the slave states. In the first two presidential elections, electors chose George Washington unanimously because they saw him as the model of everything a president should be. But after his retirement in 1796, electors were choosing from among a number of political leaders who had relatively equal stature and certainly much less than Washington. Would you tell us about the election of 1796 and how the structure of the Electoral College shaped that election? For one thing, I think it also should be said in terms of understanding the origins of the institution that you know, the framers in Philadelphia all knew that Washington was very likely to be the first president. And I think that that relaxed them a little bit about the whole notion about getting the design of the institution right. What happens in the 1790s, I mean, we know Washington is this consensus president and there's not too much doubt and concern about that. But by 1796, first post-Washington election, one very important thing that happened is that political parties were starting to crystallize. The whole design of the system and popular conceptions were that parties ought not exist, should not exist, but they were starting to form, not in full-fledged fashion, but they were starting to form. And those partisan interests play a role in the 1796 election. The other thing that we have to keep in mind about the 1796 election was that at the time, there was no separate balloting for a vice president. The way the original constitution read, the person who got the largest number of electoral votes became president, and the person who got the second largest number became vice president. So turning to the 1796 election, what happens there is that there are two Federalist candidates led by John Adams, and there are also two Republican candidates. It's Jefferson and Aaron Burr. You know, even though those names hadn't fully crystallized, that was there. 
But there was a lot of scheming going on, particularly among Federalists. Hamilton did not want Adams to become president. So he schemed to try to have people cast their second votes, which were equal. You didn't identify them as number one and number two, for Pinckney, who was, in many people's minds, the vice presidential candidate. But there was scheming going on back and forth, the ultimate upshot of which was that Adams ends up being elected president But because of the scheming about electors, Jefferson gets the second largest number of votes. So Adams becomes president and Jefferson becomes vice president. I should also say in terms of the way the Electoral College affected this is that during this first decade and really for several decades thereafter, a lot of the important politicking that was going on was not in the end in the casting of electoral votes but it was in the races for state legislatures because the state legislatures would decide how electoral votes would be cast. In other words, they could decide to cast electoral votes by themselves, and they often did. Or they could decide to use either a winner-take-all system, which was then called the general ticket, or districts. And the choices among those had real partisan implications. So you have a lot of this partisan jockeying in every state legislature for a year and a half leading up to the actual casting of electoral votes. And that problem only got worse four years later in 1800, when now President John Adams and Vice President Thomas Jefferson were again the leading candidates. Of course, this election famously ended in an electoral college tie between Thomas Jefferson and not Adams, but Aaron Burr, who was another Democratic Republican like Jefferson, and in this case, a New Yorker. Could you talk about the role of the Electoral College in this election and why the Electoral College failed to determine a president? Let me make a general statement broadly. I think that this was an important institutional design failure. By having the constitutional provision saying that electors will be chosen in such manner as each state shall decide, that was not a firm rule. That was establishing a rule that said that each state could change the rules for every election, and they did. When the 1800 election came around, one of the things that happened famously was that Virginia, which had been strongly, strongly choosing electors by districts, Virginia decided instead to use winner take all, to use the general ticket. They did that because Jefferson in 1796 had lost the presidency by only three electoral votes, one of which came from a Virginia Federalist. To avoid a repeat of that, Virginia switched to a winner-take-all or general ticket system, which produced enormous conflict within Virginia, enormous outcries. John Marshall, gone to become the notable Supreme Court, was so enraged by this that he determined never to vote again in a presidential election as long as Virginia used the general ticket. But in response to Virginia's action, then Massachusetts, the home of John Adams, did essentially the same thing. They had also been using a district system, and they switched to having the legislature choose. So the electoral college, or the outline of this institution, plays a very big role in the lead-up to the election. In fact, I don't remember the precise number, but I think in 1800, only six out of 15 or 16 states actually held popular elections. In the majority of states, the legislatures decided. Now, what then happens is that Jefferson and Burr both win a majority of the electoral votes. They have the same number of electoral votes. They're in a situation where it's tied. And thus, according to the Constitution, the election reverted to the House of Representatives. This was what's called the contingent election system. And it went to the House of Representatives in which each state delegation got one vote. You know, not each member of the House, but each state got one vote, which meant and still means that the smallest states would wield as much power as the largest states. And in the House, the situation was really very peculiar because the Republicans, all of whom, or nearly all of whom, believed that Jefferson was their actual presidential candidate. The Republicans controlled 
eight state delegations, but they needed nine to elect Jefferson. And so the outcome was going to be determined in the House by their quite mortal enemies, the Federalists. And it was deadlocked in the House. It was deadlocked through a lot of different ballots. There was talk of significant civil strife and social disorder until finally Delaware's sole member of the House decided that he would abstain and that by doing that, the election would go to Jefferson. You know, that just doesn't seem like it speaks well for how presidential elections were designed in the Constitution. Part of what it says, I mean, in terms of our understanding our institutional history, is this system is designed in 1787. And by 1800, it has yielded an electoral crisis of extraordinary proportions, where there's a tie, it goes to the House, determination of preferences in the House is just being done by all sorts of partisanship and personal dislikes. There was a threat that if the deadlock wasn't broken and Congress adjourned, which could have happened, you know, if they continued to deadlock, then there would be no president until Congress reconvened nine months later. So the system had failed. You mentioned a little earlier that state legislatures had engaged in shenanigans, for lack of a better word to try to sway electoral votes to one party or the other. And the most striking example of that seems to come from New York. Can you tell us about what happened there? Just how far would politicians go to gain control of electoral votes? Well, what happened in New York was that there was jockeying going on beforehand between the Federalists and the Republicans. The Federalists seemed to be in control of the state although the state politically was quite divided, but the Federalists seemed to have a majority in the state legislature. And they thus decided that the election would be conducted according to the general ticket, that's to say all electors would vote for the same person. The Republicans had objected to that. The Republicans introduced a measure in the legislature asking that they choose electors by district, but the Federalist legislature rebuffed that. Then in a surprise development between that decision and the presidential election, there were state legislative elections, which resulted in a sudden Republican majority in the New York legislature, which, given the presence of winner take all, now meant that the Republicans would win all of New York's electoral votes. Hamilton, who was really the most prolific schemer in all of these presidential elections to strike the maneuver, really almost subvert procedures in order to get his way. Hamilton then tried to prevail upon John Jay, who was governor of New York, to call the lame duck legislature back into session, the previous legislature, the Federalist nominated legislature, back into session in order to pass a law mandating district elections, because in that way, the Federalists could still salvage a number of electoral votes in New York, which they could not, according to the general ticket, which is what they had pressed for some months earlier. So Hamilton is pressing Jay to take this extraordinary step to change the agreed-upon rules in the election in order to benefit the Federalists. And Jay rebuffs that. and. There's a hand-scrawled note on a piece of paper in which he says, you know, something like, making such a decision for partisan purposes would not become me. And so they stick with the rules that were in place. After the election of 1800, many political leaders saw the same problems that you've just identified with the system for electing presidents. Can you talk about some of the reform proposals that members of Congress and others discussed after that election? How did they come to settle on what became the 12th Amendment to the Constitution? Sure, there were two concerns on the minds of many people active in political life after the election of 1800, or these concerns had even been present before. One was referred to as the process of designation, that it appeared to be a mistake to have designed the system so that the person who got the most votes became president and the person who got the second most votes became vice president. And in effect, parties were forming and there were de facto tickets, but they weren't formalized. And there was this problem, the problem that appeared in 1800, which is that if 
everybody who wanted a particular party voted for the first and second candidates, there would be a tie, and then it would end up in the House, and that seemed pointless. So one of the things that was desired was for designation. And designation, we think of it in retrospect, I think we tend to think of it as tidying up a little bit of a mess that had been created. And it was that, but it was not a mere clerical reconciliation. It was also an acknowledgement of the appearance and growth and probably the endurance of parties, and thus the acknowledgement of the existence of tickets. And that really embodied a different vision of what a presidential election should be. I mean, this benign notion in the original Constitution that, well, the most qualified man, the person who got the most votes would become president, and the second most qualified man would become vice president. By 1800, it's clear that what needs to be fought out on certain kinds of partisan grounds with tickets. It also diminishes the importance of the vice president in a number of critical ways and diminishes the standing of the vice president. As people pointed out at the time, that the vice president with designation became the running mate of the presidential candidate, not the second most qualified person in the country to become president. So that was one concern, was the designation. A second concern, which started out as being just as important, or perhaps more important, was to end the jockeying that went on between having the state legislatures choose or having general ticket elections or district elections They just wanted to stabilize that, and a lot of people wanted to stabilize it with district elections. The large majority of political leaders thought that district elections for electors would be better than the general ticket. So you have these two ideas circulating around starting in 1801 and into 1802, and the upshot of it by the end with the 12th Amendment was that the proposal for district elections got jettisoned or put on the back burner. And the proposal for designation went through, but only in a series of very close votes. There was not unanimous agreement about the 12th Amendment, but it did happen and it was ratified. What happens with the jettisoning of the district proposal, it really has to do with partisan politics also. It had been strongly advocated by some Federalists and many Republicans. Jefferson was a big advocate of districts. Madison was a big advocate of districts. And so were many others. That was particularly strong in the late 1790s when it looked like the Republicans were maybe a minority party. By the congressional elections of 1802, it looked like the Republicans were actually a majority party. Not only was Jefferson president, but Congress was controlled by the Republicans. In that circumstance, I'm looking ahead to the election of 1804. Winner take all looked pretty good to the Republicans. And they had less interest in changing the system to a district system, which might allow the Federalists to pick up more votes. So a lot of Republican leaders backed off their support of district elections. And there was a lot of talk about, well, after we get the 12th Amendment, we'll pick this up again in the next session of Congress. But it did not happen. But it turns out that that wasn't the end of attempts to try to change the electoral system in the early U.S., Can you talk about some of the reform proposals that were made in the 1810s and 1820s? How would they have affected the system for electing the president? And why did they never achieve sufficient support to become part of the Constitution? The years between roughly 1812 and 1826 constituted the period, or at least one of two periods, perhaps, of the greatest political concern about the electoral college system and the electoral system and the most strenuous efforts to reform it. There were incidents in 1812, for example, where state legislatures once again changed the system of voting sort of at the last minute for partisan reasons. In one instance, I think it was New Jersey even canceling a scheduled election and giving it to the state legislature. The system was really an outrage. The rules were changing all the time. Different states were having different kinds of elections or using different methods to choose electors. And they were changing from one election to the next. There was neither uniformity nor stability in the electoral system. So what first emerges is a set of proposals simply to mandate 
through the Constitution that everybody had to use district elections. A constitutional amendment mandating that was approved by the Senate four times in this period. And on one of those occasions, it came within a very few votes of winning in the House of Representatives. Now, why did it do less well in the House? I think the best I can do to answer that is to say that there was some reluctance in the large states to give up winner-take-all or the general ticket, because winner-take-all gave a lot of clout to large states, which had big blocks of electoral votes. But still, the reform passed. What then happens, and thinking about this starts to change in the late teens and it continues into the 1820s, was that representatives of the large states, as well as other critics of the system, also start looking at the contingent election system, which had produced such a mess in 1800, and which seemed so unwieldy and in some sense so undemocratic in 1800. But it also greatly advantaged the small states. So what congressional leaders tried to put together, and actually in Madison from outside endorsed this, was to put together a package which would combine mandatory district elections and a revamping of the contingent election system so that it would not be the case that it would be decided in the House with each state delegation getting one vote. There are a lot of different proposals about the contingent election system. The most common one was to have the entire Congress decide or to have the House decide, but with each representative getting one vote. The idea here was to forge a new updated compromise between large states and small states. And making a deal like that seemed all the more pressing because of the election of 1824, where once again, the election went to the House and the way in which the House dealt with it ended up drawing a great deal of criticism for political corruption of various sorts. But they were never able to quite put together the deal to do both parts of this package, district elections and getting rid of the contingent package. In 1826, the House of Representatives votes by a very, very large vote. It's quite remarkable that it wants to get rid of its power to decide congressional elections. They want to strip away from their own body, from the House of Representatives, the power to decide presidential elections. But then they couldn't get agreement at that point on a district elections proposal. So you have these two things which were both very much in need of reform, people working towards putting together a package, and it never quite came together, although it got very close. The men who wrote the Constitution knew that the system for electing the president was imperfect, and representatives in the early Congresses agreed as they worked on reform proposals. But in the decades after the Twelfth Amendment was ratified, no additional reforms were adopted even though members of Congress and others proposed numerous ideas for how to improve the election process. As Alex explained, that doesn't mean that reforms have been unpopular. The bar for amending the Constitution is very high. First, two-thirds of each House of Congress must vote in favor of sending an amendment to the states, and then three-fourths of the state legislatures must approve ratification. And that's the easier path. As a result, the system for electing the president has persisted largely intact for over two centuries, even as the nation has grown and changed dramatically. Now that we've discussed the Electoral College in focus, we should shift our view. At several points, Alex mentioned that partisan politics played a key role in determining how early presidential elections took place. Frank Cogliano can help us explore that world of partisan politics to situate the Electoral College in the broader political culture of the early United States. Frank is professor of American history at the University of Edinburgh. He's the author of several books on politics and culture in the early United States, including most recently, Emperor of Liberty, Thomas Jefferson's Foreign Policy, which he discussed with Liz in episode 131. He's also the co-host of his own American history podcast, The Whiskey Rebellion. Frank will help us see presidential elections within the context of America's first political parties. And we'll speak with Frank right after Liz tells us about our episode sponsor. As Joe and Alex have helped us to see, there seems to have always been a fair amount of confusion about how the President of the United States is elected. 
and hopefully our forthcoming conversation with Joe and Frank Cogliano about the election of 1800 can help us make more sense of this difficult system. Now, as you know from our many conversations on this podcast, most of what historians know about our institutions, like the Electoral College, and how they've developed over time, comes from their research in historical records. Conducting historical research is a painstaking process. It's a multi-year process that includes searching out historical sources, interpreting those sources, and then taking what you found to make a case for why we should view the past a certain way. Likewise, each episode of Ben Franklin's World is a result of a painstaking process. Each minute you hear on this podcast is a result of one hour of the audio team's labor. Now, the Omohundro Institute and I are committed to putting in this work because we want you to have access to well-researched history and information about the early American past. But this commitment takes resources, and we could really use your help. This is why I'm asking you to support our work by joining the Ben Franklin's World subscription program. Your subscription of $5.99 per month or $60 per year will help us continue to produce the high-quality episodes that you've come to love. Episodes that skip hyperbole and provide solid historical research on complex issues. Plus, you'll also be supporting a podcast that finds its way into classrooms and study guides, lunchtime learning sessions, and extended dinnertime conversations. As a thank you for your support, you'll receive a monthly bonus episode on the last Friday of each month. And you'll never have your episodes interrupted again with ads like this one. So please become a subscriber. Join our subscription program, benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe, and help us continue to bring exciting new historical scholarship right to your ears. Join us at benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. Most Americans today are familiar with politics operating through a two-party system. In fact, it seems ingrained in American society. But the Constitution doesn't mention parties at all as part of the system of government. And one of the assumptions that the Constitution's framers made when they were drafting the document was that national political parties wouldn't develop. Frank, can you discuss why the framers thought that? Why did they think that the American political system would operate without parties? Sure. And this is an interesting question, Joe. It's an important question, if only because it's a it's a nice reminder for people who are inclined to see the Constitution as sacred writ that the people who framed it got something spectacularly wrong. And this is a good example of that. So the framers of the Constitution believed that there would be no political parties in the early United States because politicians would be selfless and virtuous, and therefore there wouldn't be competing interests that would coalesce into parties. They had an example right before their eyes, of course, which was the British Constitution and the British political system, which did have political factions and parties, but they believed that they had created a system that would be premised on selflessness and virtue and self-sacrifice on the part of political office holders, and that those people would not act in such a way that would result in the emergence and the evolution of political parties. You know, we ascribe all sorts of wisdom to the founders and so on and the framers of the Constitution, but in this particular respect, they simply misread what was going on around them. One thing they did have in the room with them was George Washington. And I always tell my students this, that in the process of drafting the Constitution, the framers looked at the front of the room where Washington was presiding over the convention, and they all assumed that he was going to be elected the first president. Part of the reason for that, I think, was because he represented a model of leadership that they knew of as a patriot king. Can you help us understand that concept, Frank? And can you talk a little bit about what the framers saw in Washington, what qualities they saw in him as the first president? Yeah, I agree with you completely on this, Joe. And I say the same thing to my students. They know who the president's going to be when they're designing the presidency in the Constitutional Convention. There's no doubt about that. There's only one choice. And as you say, he was elected unanimously in the Electoral College twice. Washington's standing in that generation is kind of beyond question. And he is the model for patriotic leadership. And, you know, the Patriot King is a good image. To some extent, they replace one George with another, but this George is even better than the other one, right? In fact, George III is reputed to have said when Washington retired, the notion that he voluntarily gave up power, if he did that, he's the greatest man who ever lived. And so Washington's reputation is so powerful, and his reputation for kind of probity is so powerful, that they're willing to invest the presidency with significant power under the Constitution. 
perhaps greater power than they would have otherwise, because he's the model. He's not a theoretical model. He's the model. He's sitting right there in the room. That will create problems otherwise, however, because, of course, Washington is not immortal and Washington serves his two terms. And then we see that, you know, it's not surprising the disputes start in 1796 and 1800 and beyond once mere mortals are competing for the presidency. So Washington as Patriot King image is really important and powerful, both for the establishment of the presidency within the Constitution or the way it's drafted for the Constitution, but also, I think, for establishing the legitimacy of the new government. You know, remember, the Constitution should not necessarily have endured. I mean, we see it now as, oh, it's 240 years old and it's sacred written, all this kind of nonsense. You know, the previous Constitution, the Articles of Confederation, lasted 13 years from drafting 1776 to 1789 when it was supplanted. It wasn't ratified till 1781. There's a huge amount of experimentation with Constitution making during the Revolutionary Era. Nobody thought this would necessarily last. And the esteem with which Americans held Washington and Washington's gravitas is so important in giving the new government and the new constitution legitimacy that it is going to shape what follows. And we end up with a sort of declension narrative where everything after Washington is seen as somehow, you know, a failure or somehow where, you know, the people who follow him and poor John Adams feels this just simply aren't up to the task. So the Patriot King image cuts both ways. It probably works very well for Washington and certainly for giving the constitution legitimacy but it does make it difficult for his successors. In other words, Washington's presence at the convention seems to have led the framers to think that they could avoid some of the partisanship that they saw going on in Britain. Elsewhere in the constitutional structure, were there ways that the government was designed that the framers thought would help them avoid those kinds of partisan factions that they saw and knew about from their understanding of British politics? I think separating, as you know, and as most listeners will know, the United States does not have a parliamentary system. Under its constitution, it has a presidential system. And so the election of the president, the president is not elected from among the members of Congress the way he or she would be in a parliamentary system as the prime minister in the UK, where I am presently, is selected from among the members of parliament. That's not what happens under the US constitution. And it was designed deliberately to separate the executive from the legislature. And I think one of the intentions of that was to forestall the emergence of political parties and factions. I mean, of course, that has had unforeseen consequences because it means occasionally in our system, which quickly developed political parties, you can have a president of one party and the legislature or the House or Senate dominated by a different political party. But the separation of those two in the Constitution, I think in part was meant to forestall the emergence of political parties. But of course, as it turns out, they failed in that project. So to better understand how the political parties developed and how that development affected the Electoral College and presidential elections, it would help to step back for a second and talk about where the political parties come from. So, Frank, can you give us a very brief introduction to the origins of the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans? As you well know, the nomenclature here and the evolution of it is a complicated one because originally The Federalists were those who supported the Constitution during the ratifying debates over that document, and they quite cleverly designated their opponents anti-Federalists. Those supporters of the Constitution will then evolve in different ways, and so some of them become what we think of as the Federalist Party, that is, the supporters of the Constitution, and others will become what we call the Republicans or Democratic Republicans or Jeffersonian Republicans. In answer to your question, however, there were two main issues which led to the divisions that led to the evolution of these partisan groupings. There was basically domestic politics, fiscal policy in particular, the Hamiltonian fiscal program proposed by Alexander Hamilton as the Secretary of the Treasury under George Washington, and questions around foreign policy, particularly the French Revolution. And what we see is in the early 1790s, the supporters of the Hamiltonian fiscal policy were also those who opposed the French Revolution and wanted the United States to have a foreign policy that was more closely oriented, both in terms of security, but also trade towards Britain, whereas the opponents of the Hamiltonian fiscal program tended to support and be sympathetic to the French Revolution and its advocates and wanted the United States to have a foreign policy which was more closely aligned toward and sympathetic towards revolutionary France. And so these twin issues of kind of questions of political economy at home and the French Revolution abroad 
lead to the emergence quite quickly of, we should really call them factions rather than parties. One of the problems with using the language of party, as you well know, is it kind of connotes modern political parties. And we're not really talking about modern political parties yet, but we use the word party because that seems useful, but it also distorts slightly. These are more kind of groupings at this point. Because remember, both sides believe that political parties are wrong. They both believe that political parties are a sign of sickness in the body politic. So this leads them to a situation where they don't accept the notion of a sort of loyal opposition that you get, for example, here in the United Kingdom, but rather our opponents must be, you know, they're subverting the republic because we're right, because there's no understanding of or acceptance of political parties. So these are kind of factions, these are groupings, which tend to see politics in a rather Manichaean fashion, and they don't allow for honest disagreements on these issues. While he was president, George Washington at least nominally tried to stay above the fray of partisan politics. But once he retired, presidential elections took on a partisan cast. Can you describe how the election of 1796 played out with political parties and factions as they vied for the presidency through the Electoral College? You're absolutely right. These partisan divisions become much more open and they manifest themselves in a much more aggressive and virulent way during the election of 1796, because that's the first openly contested presidential election, which pits John Adams, the Federalist vice president, against Thomas Jefferson, who, along with James Madison, is one of the leaders of the so-called Democratic Republicans. Jefferson had lately been in Washington's cabinet as Secretary of State. And so we have this really important election in 1796 pitting these two kind of giant figures from the revolution and previously quite close friends against each other. Jeff Pasley, of course, has written a very, very good book, a great book on the election of 1796. And it's quite a bitter election because Americans are trying to figure out how to do partisan politics in a climate and in a culture where partisan politics aren't supposed to prevail. And it's the first time that we have a truly contested election We do not yet have mass politics, though. So I think it's only in seven states that there's popular voting of any kind in the election of of 1796. But this is the first time we see a contested election and a contested election which plays out in the Electoral College. And that election produced something that we in the 21st century would consider pretty bizarre with Adams and Jefferson, who were partisan rivals, becoming president and vice president, because, as Alex Kaser noted a little earlier, Electors did not designate their votes for president or vice president. They simply cast two ballots and whoever became in first became president, whoever came in second became vice president. So how did the executive branch function, Frank, or did it function during the Adams administration with these two partisan rivals at the head? Well, this was a uh, it was a problem. But again, it arises, you know, going back to your very first question. In a culture where there's not supposed to be partisanship, that kind of arrangement makes sense because if the individuals running for president are supposed to be selfless, virtuous gentlemen who are sacrificing their self-interest to the good of the republic, then of course they should serve together. But it doesn't make sense in a partisan context. So in answer to your question as to how the Adams administration functioned, it didn't function very well for a number of reasons. First of all, Adams retained a lot of George Washington's cabinet, and those people weren't terribly loyal to John Adams. Secondly, as you noted, the vice president, Thomas Jefferson, was not loyal to John Adams at all in political terms. They had had a personal relationship before, but that was put under a great strain at this point. And Jefferson, again, along with Madison, is effectively leading the opposition to the Adams administration during the Adams administration. And again, this strikes us as incredibly disloyal today, but we have to cast our minds back to a time when partisan loyalties you know, were evolving. They were embryonic at this point. So what appears to us to be incredible disloyalty on the part of Jefferson looks to Jefferson like, well, he's just following his principles. Four years later, of course, Adams and Jefferson face off again, uh, along with a number of other candidates. And at this point, the two factions have begun designating informally candidates for president or vice president. But that informal system fails in 1800, and we end up with the first disputed presidential election in U.S. history. Frank, what happened? Oh, that's simple. 
I mean, on one hand, it's a bit like, you know, the last Avengers movie. So it's the sequel to the one that came immediately before it. It's meant to wrap it all up and it doesn't do it very well. What happened in 1800? It's very, very confusing. And I'm glad, Joe, that you mentioned that lots of people were running because we tend, and I just did it a minute ago, we say, okay, Adams ran against Jefferson in 1796. And that's true. But there were other candidates as well. And so there were always local favorites. And so there were multiple candidates in these early elections because there wasn't a kind of nominating process of the kind we have today. And in 1800, what we get is Adams and Jefferson are acknowledged as the, if you will, the leaders of the ticket, the top of the ticket for their respective parties. And again, I'm using parties advisedly. But it's not that simple. One of the most important people running in 1800 is Aaron Burr from New York. And Burr is running with Jefferson. However, he's a very ambitious man himself. And it turns out the Jeffersonian Republicans have much more party discipline than the Federalists do. So in the Electoral College, once the first round of voting, as it were, is done, Jefferson and Burr end up on the same number of electoral votes. So Adams loses the election. There's no question of that. But then we've got a situation where the two people running on behalf of the Democratic Republicans actually have the same number of votes in the Electoral College. Now, the Electoral College, as it was originally designed, has a way to address this, which is the election would then go to the House of Representatives to be sorted out. Where things get complicated, it's the outgoing House of Representatives that would determine the outcome of the election in 1800. That House of Representatives was dominated by grumpy Federalists who had lost their elections, lost their seats, and were about to go off into retirement. And so you get the outgoing House of Representatives that sits in February of 1800 and has to choose who the president will be, and they have to choose between Burr and Jefferson. Now, everybody knew that Jefferson was really the top of the ticket. Aaron Burr was uncharacteristically quiet. And he let people say, people who didn't like Jefferson, he basically let a little momentum build for the possibility, at least, of him being elected president rather than Jefferson. And so we end up with this bizarre electoral deadlock in the winter of 1800-1801 that's not resolved until February of 1801. If I can just take a step back and say there's some really interesting things that happened during that period. Again, candidates didn't campaign in 1800 or 1796. People did it on their behalf. And so because politicians, again, were meant to be selfless and virtuous, they couldn't be seen to be ambitious, although Burr was a bit more open about his ambitions than Jefferson. However, they did take some actions. And so Jefferson, in January of 1801, visits Martha Washington at Mount Vernon. And he does so with the stated intention of paying his respects to Martha Washington and acknowledging the death of George Washington. George Washington had died in December of 1799, 13 months before. Martha Washington smelled a rat and recognized that Jefferson was there basically to get the posthumous imprimatur of George Washington because the Federalist-dominated House of Representatives was about to meet and choose the president. She is reputed to have said the two worst days of her life were the day George Washington died and the day that Thomas Jefferson came to visit her at Mount Vernon. So she wasn't fooled by Jefferson. And so there's politicking going on, but it's not politics as we know it. So we go forward a few weeks till the middle of February, and the House of Representatives, again, the outgoing Federalist-dominated House of Representatives, has to choose between Jefferson and Burr. And it's only on the 36th ballot that the House of Representatives finally comes around and chooses Jefferson as the president and Aaron Burr as the vice president. Now, you asked me a few minutes ago how relations were between Adams and Jefferson when Jefferson had to serve as Adams' as vice president. They were difficult. You can only imagine what it was like between Jefferson and Burr, because Burr, if he hadn't quite made a play for the presidency, he hadn't obstructed such a play. And you know their relationship was never the same again, and theirs was not a very productive relationship. you got to read Joanne Freeman on this, really. She's the one who really has deconstructed this the best, I think. Speaking of Aaron Burr, over the past five years, thanks to Lynn Wenmel Miranda, lots of people have thought about, wondered about Alexander Hamilton's role in the election of 1800, and especially his role in what happens in the House of Representatives when the election is pushed there. So historically speaking, did Hamilton play a role in the House of Representatives? Was he able to 
influence the decision making of his fellow Federalists? Yes and no. Hamilton plays a prominent role in the election of 1800, but it's mainly to torpedo John Adams' candidacy because Hamilton famously writes a pamphlet which excoriates John Adams in the run up to the election in 1800. And so Hamilton really does a job on Adams's candidacy because Hamilton and Adams didn't get along. With regard to Hamilton's role in solving the contested election, that's less clear. I mean, Hamilton seems to have tried to be a little bit mischievous and suggested to some Federalist members of Congress that they might support Burr. It's not clear that they actually did, though. Again, Joanne Freeman is the best source for a lot of this stuff. And Joanne has written sort of really wonderful essay, very short essay on the election of 1800 in the uh, Blackwell Companion to Jefferson that I had the privilege of editing a few years ago. And in that, she suggests, you know, Hamilton wasn't all that effective because he wasn't all that popular. And so his attempts to influence the election by influencing Federalist congressmen, you know, weren't terribly effective. So I think that Hamilton plays a prominent role in the election of 1800, but that's mainly in the earlier stages to undermine John Adams and less so in resolving the crisis, notwithstanding the version one gets from Lin-Manuel Miranda. Four years after the 1800 election, Congress passed and the states ratified the 12th Amendment, which addressed this very problem of the second place finisher becoming the vice president and replaced it with a system where there were separate elections for president and vice president through the Electoral College. As we know, amendments to the Constitution have been very rare. Before the 12th Amendment, there was the Bill of Rights, and then the 11th Amendment in the 1790s. And then after the 12th Amendment, there are no more amendments until over 60 years later after the end of the Civil War. Why do you think, Frank, this particular moment created conditions for Congress and the states to actually get an amendment through? I think because people recognize that the system as it was designed wasn't working. And it goes back to you know the beginning of this conversation, Joe. The belief that people would selflessly serve and there wouldn't be partisan differences by 1804, that's clearly a nonsense. And they've acknowledged that it hasn't worked. You know, Adams was a successful vice president to Washington, but anybody would have served Washington as vice president because there was no doubt about who had the authority in that relationship. But, you know, the problematic relationship between Jefferson and Adams as a result of the election of 1796 revealed that this was a dubious way of operating. And that was brought out into the open with the kind of, I won't say fiasco, because the system worked in 1800 as it was designed to work, but it wasn't a satisfying outcome, certainly. And I think it's an acknowledgement that partisanship existed and that pairs would run together, as it were. There would be what we now think of as tickets and that that would be the way to operate. And to avoid the kind of confusion that happened in 1800, you know, there were threats and historians debate how real these threats were to call out militias in both Virginia and Pennsylvania during the prolonged election controversy in 1800, 1801. And there was a worry that the Constitution could fail if this wasn't rectified. And so I think it's an acknowledgement that partisanship existed. And it's a recognition that the Electoral College was originally designed under the Constitution wasn't working. And they're seeking to kind of rectify that anomaly. Since the 12th Amendment was ratified in 1804, there have been very few changes to the constitutional process for electing the president. The 22nd Amendment was ratified in 1951, and that limited an individual to two presidential terms. Then in 1961, the 23rd Amendment granted three electoral votes to the District of Columbia. Other than that, we're still electing presidents under the same system that has been in place for over 200 years. What has shifted is the method for choosing electors. As Alex explained, only a few states actually held popular elections in 1800, but by the 1830s, nearly every state did, and that's how each state selects its electors today. It took time for various states to settle on one preferred method. Both Alex and Frank talked about examples from early presidential elections when politicians tried to use the ambiguity of the Constitution's language to mess with their state's process for selecting electors to benefit their preferred candidate. That meant that states such as New York, Virginia, and Massachusetts could use a different method for choosing electors every four years, depending on which party controlled the state legislature. And though nearly all states use the same method now, the language in the Constitution still leaves it to the legislatures to decide how to run the election within their states. Now, there's one last issue I need to mention as if things weren't already confusing enough. 
See, we've been talking about the Electoral College as if it's a real institution, but it turns out it's not. We use the term to describe the electors who pick the president, but the Electoral College never actually meets as a full group because the electors cast ballots in their own state capitals. And as it turns out, the Constitution never mentions a college or any other entity, just the electors. In fact, the term only came into wide use, as Alex explains in his book, to describe the whole group of electors in the early 20th century. Whatever we call it, the system for electing the president and vice president remains, for now anyway, both indirect and a little confusing. But hopefully our guest historians, Alex Kesar and Frank Cogliano, have helped clear up the process of how it came to be. Thanks for listening. And thank you, Joe, for that fascinating investigation. You'll find more information about Joe, his guests, Alexander Kisar and Frank Cogliano, plus notes and links for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 287. If you don't want this series to end, please remember that Holly, Joe, and I have created a resource list so that you can take your interest in early American elections further with companion readings, museum exhibits, and digital projects. You'll find this resource guide at benfranklinsworld.com slash oireader. Now, if you did enjoy this series, please tell your friends and family about it. Word of mouth recommendations are the best way for podcasts to find new listeners. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Holly White, Karen Wolf, and Peyton Young. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Finally, we'll be back in two weeks with a brand new episode of Ben Franklin's World. And from there, we'll return to our every other week publication schedule until we have another series to share with you. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute, and production of this episode was made possible by a grant from the Roller Baltimore Foundation of Richmond, Virginia.